anyways, I learned that I was on Interpol's most wanted list while eating milk broccoli on the first class deck of a ferry on the Rhine somewhere between Heidelberg and Karlsruhe. Germany has laws on the books to protect whistleblowers in the financial sector. The Finanzdienstleistungs auf six Gazettes, or FINDAG, declares the federal office does not disclose the identity of a person who has filed a report without first obtaining the express consent of that person. Furthermore, the federal agency does not disclose the identity of a person who is the subject of a report. Well, apparently, the Oberlander Gerichte, the high state court, hasn't read subsection 3 of the FINDAG. Because after I handed over the leaked documents to Desite and to The Guardian, they immediately filed charges and issued a warrant for my arrest. Those guys sure know how to ruin a perfectly good milk project. I joined Deutsche Bank in 2002 after seven years with Chase in New York. Deutsche was in the midst of a poaching spree, lapping up bankers at New York firms like a cat with a bowl of crack-laced milk. Deutsche Bank was intent on playing with the big boys, so they hired the big boys, the biggest boys. I had experience in New York real estate, having worked on a number of high-value projects in Manhattan and Brooklyn. Not to toot my own horn, but Jay-Z's team, they play basketball in an arena that wouldn't exist had it not been for a few well-played cards up my sleeve. Suffice it to say that designating the arena as publicly owned did wonders for the tax burden. Bank flagged transactions tied to entities controlled by Donald Trump and his son-in-law Jared Kushner, saying they should be reported to a federal watchdog for financial crimes. That's according to a report in the New York Times on Sunday, who cited five current or former employees at the German-based bank. The sources told the Times the bank rejected the advice from their own anti-money laundering specialists, and that those reports were never filed with the government. The transactions had reportedly set off alerts in a computer system designed to detect illegal activity, some of which involves Trump's now defunct foundation. The report said the nature of the transactions was not clear, but that some involved money moving back and forth with overseas entities. Compliance staff have prepared reports on some of the transactions in question that they believe should have been sent to a unit of the Treasury Department that releases financial crimes, according to the report. Staff members who spoke to the Times said they saw the decision not to report those transactions as part of a pattern of bank executives protecting relationships with the unit clients. A Deutsche Bank spokesperson was quoted in the report saying the bank's investigators were not prevented from escalating suspicious transactions. A Trump Organization spokesperson told the Times the story was, quote, absolute nonsense. And the Kushner Organization called the allegations made up and totally false. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, uh, that's a song from our new album. It should be out uh, in October. Uh, the album is called Nettlebeck, uh, and we named the record after Uwe Nettlebeck. Maybe some of you have heard of him. Uh, he's a pretty interesting guy. Uh, he started off as a film critic for uh, the German newspaper Die Zeit, uh, and then uh, took over this smaller kind of underground magazine called Konkret. Uh, and he moved them over to the kind of radical end of the German political spectrum, and they became an outlet for political writers, including people like Ulrika Meinhof. Uh, and, and then kind of amazingly, after all that, uh, Nettlebeck went on to found the krautrock band Faust. And Faust would uh, rehearse in this, uh, this little kind of disused schoolhouse in this rural town called Fumma. And uh, when they were there, sometimes they would wind up sheltering 
uh, members of the Bader Meinhof gang who were on, uh, you know, on, on the run from the authorities. Um, and it turns out there's actually quite a few kind of interesting connections between kraut rock bands, you know, the music that we call kraut rock now, and the, the Bader Meinhof gang or the Red Army Faction as they were also known, the RAF. Um, for instance, the band Amandul II lived on a commune uh, where some of the future members of the RAF also lived. So, yeah, small world. Um, anyway, this next song is also from the new record. Uh, this one's about, um, uh, you know, financial corruption, paranoia, and baked goods. It's called uh, Eating Milk Brotchen on the Rhine. In 2003, we sold hundreds of millions of dollars in bonds to institutional investors on behalf of Trump hotels and casino resorts. And just one year later, Trump defaulted on those same bonds. Our clients took a bath. After that, the division of the bank that sold the bonds cut all ties with the Trump organization. But right around the same time, Trump approached another department of the bank, the commercial real estate division where I work. He was looking for a $500 million loan to build the Trump Tower in Chicago. 
I'll be honest, we were in no hurry to make the loan. There had been some disagreement about Trump's net worth. You see, for the loans, Trump reported his net worth at $3 billion with a B. But a New York Times journalist named Timothy O'Brien did some digging and reported that Trump's actual net worth was $788 million with an M. Still nothing to sneeze at, but when somebody lies on a loan application, there's usually a reason. Let's just say that a few of us were concerned, so we flag it for review. But then, a couple of days later, I get a direct email, nobody CC'd, just me, from Rosemary Verbalik, one of Deutsch's managing directors. She and Trump were introduced by his son-in-law, Jared Kushner, and since then, Rosemary has become something like Trump's personal banker. From what I'm told, she had a pretty good seat at Trump's inauguration. So Rosemary tells me to go ahead and approve the loan. This brought the total value of loans made by Deutsche Bank to Donald Trump to $2 billion. That's more than the nominal GDP of the entire country of Belize. So the loan went through, and now there it sits on the banks of the Chicago River. Trump's name in 20-foot-tall letters sticking his tongue out at the whole city of Chicago. This is Trump Tower in Chicago. If you look closely at the scaffolding to the right, you can see the pea being delivered, probably by Russian prostitutes. Ten years after the building opened, they have still yet to attract even one tenant to the lobby's retail space, leading Esquire magazine to run the headline, Trump's real estate company is not very good at real estate. Trump is so worried that people will think he's merely a millionaire and not a billionaire that he took legal action. And the only reason that we know anything at all about Trump's financial situation or his inflated self-reported net worth is due to a deposition that Trump himself gave as part of a lawsuit that he filed against the New York Times and Timothy O'Brien. And it didn't stop there. Apparently Trump prowled Twitter picking fights with anyone who dared to suggest that he had ever declared bankruptcy. On December 13th, 2012, at the time, Trump, who had two million followers on Twitter, tweeted at Mike Stacy, a New York Mets fan with 55 followers, I never went bankrupt. He tweeted the same message to C.J. O'Leary from Columbus, Ohio, 58 followers, and to Lydia O oh from Toronto, 122 followers. To Dillon from Southampton, Ontario, 42 followers, he tweeted, Dopey, I never filed for bankruptcy. At Mike Stacy, I never went bankrupt.
At CJ O'Leary, I never went bankrupt. At Dillon, Dopey, I never filed for bankruptcy. Thank you. Uh, this next song, uh, also from the new record, uh, this one's about, uh, thank you. This one's about um, Alfred Herrhausen, who was uh, the CEO of Deutsche Bank, uh, became CEO in the 1980s. And he's really the one who pushed Deutsche Bank out of kind of private lending and into investment banking. Uh, so he's really the one who kind of turned Deutsche Bank into the global financial behemoth that we all know now. Uh, it's also how they kind of ended up in bed with Donald Trump, because you see, in the 90s, Trump had burned his credit with every bank in New York City. There wasn't a single one that would loan him any money. And at the same time, uh, Deutsche Bank was trying to break into the New York City financial markets. That was a primary goal for the, for the bank. So you kind of ended up with this, uh, you know, this uh, real estate developer with delusions of grandeur, and on the other side, this bank that's trying to move into the upper echelons of the financial industry. So it leads to this kind of late night, late capitalist, swipe right marriage of convenience. This, you know, this kind of not so much a shotgun wedding as a you know, late night cash grab booty call uh, in the middle of the neoliberal night. So that's what this next song's about. Um, uh, this is the single from the new record and it's called uh, Bargeld ist de neue Liebe.
these are painted pictures of the bottom man half gang about the day they killed themselves at Staman Jail. Maybe you've seen the Richter paintings at your local gallery or on the internet. Yeah, probably on the World Wide Web. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks for being here tonight. Um, yeah, thank you. And thanks to Loop for, for having us, and thanks to Liquid Architecture for bringing us here. Um, you know, it's really nice. We're a long way from our hometown of Chicago, so it's really great to have a, a generous response like this. And, you know, it just seems to me in this day and age, we really need to find ways to make our own generosity. You know, if the Trumps and the Deutsche Banks of the world had their way, We'd never turn up for anybody else's thing. We'd never offer our support or a kind word. You know, but there's something about uh, art and music and film and stuff, something about the collective act of paying attention, you know? Um, it's, it, it changes the, our, you know, our kind of relationships to each other. And it, it, you know, it's not a matter of like joining our arms together and proclaiming that love is all there is, but when we gather in spaces like this and devote our eyes and our ears and our brains to, to something outside of ourselves, to, you know, to the world or to history or to each other, then it seems to me we're striking a blow against the me, myself, I-ism that, you know, that reigns in this sick time of banks and the bankrupted. You know, so it's a matter of sort of finding a way to get out of ourselves and get lost, right? I think that's what the Krautrock bands were after. I think that's what Gerhard Richter's been after. I think maybe that's what uh, Andreas Bader and Ulrika Meinhof were after, right? Just finding some way to get out of, out of ourselves and get lost. The world always claims to know where it's going. So it's important sometimes to reject that notion and sometimes it's important to just get lost. You know, because things that never get lost never get found, right? By 2008, Trump Tower in Chicago was a they were having a devil of a time selling condo units, and the loan from Deutsche Bank was coming due in November. But on September 15th, Lehman Brothers went belly up and everything changed. Not only did Trump claim that the financial crisis was an act of God that should let him out of his debt, but he sued Deutsche Bank for $3 billion in damages, claiming that the bank, the same bank that had loaned him the GDP of Belize was responsible for the crisis. Needless to say, the investment banking division cut ties with Trump. was the year that Jared Kushner introduced Trump to Rosemary Vervalik. And despite the fact that Deutsche's investment bankers had washed their hands of Trump, Rosemary worked her magic, securing a $100 million loan for the Doral Golf Resort in Florida, and another $48 million, get this, for the same Chicago Tower that Trump had defaulted on and sued the bank over. Trump said he would use the second loan to repay what he owed on the first one. 
I mean, this is nuts. Even the New York Times thought so. Here's what they wrote. Even by Wall Street standards, borrowing money from one part of a bank to pay off a loan from another was an extraordinary act of financial chutzpah. And for my non-Jewish, non-New York friends, let me do a little impromptu translating for you. By chutzpah, they mean, this guy's got some major cojones. But look, I was on the inside, and I could see what was going on, piece by dirty piece. This was a classic case of power making money and money making power. So I did what anybody with a conscience would have done. I blew the whistle. And for that, I'm rewarded with an international arrest warrant. No Ecuadorian embassy for me. I sleep in a different bed every night, and I know that soon I'm going to run out of beds. Meanwhile, Donald Trump, who would still be just a two-bit player in New York real estate if it hadn't been for Deutsche Bank's demonic love of bargaining, is sleeping in the White House.